Uh, Chris Vinny, the athletic for uh, coach and DJ, uh, the fact that this game is Duke, uh, the rivalry, does, what does that add to what's already a monster game? Yeah, I don't – I know it's a – I know it's a rivalry and we're down the street for one another, but when you get to this point, you know, I was sitting there, I was sitting with a group of friends last night as we were watching the game and everybody's, you know, of course everybody in the room wants to know who you want to play. And I just said, hey, when you get to this point, you're blessed to be here and you'll take the opportunity to play whoever you get a chance to play. Um, you know, luckily we have played Duke a couple of times, so we are a little bit more familiar with those guys. Um, but they're playing really good basketball, and they're doing a great job with it. But it's not one of those things um, where we were just, you know, rooting for one team over the other. I know for um, a lot of NC State fans, it was going to come down to they were hoping that it would be very similar to 83 and playing Houston. But uh, unfortunately, it didn't work that way. So we're excited. We just we know that, you know, when you get down to eight teams left in the entire country to play an entire basketball. Everybody's good. And do, we, even though we played them 18 days ago, it's a different team, and we're a different team also. David Teal with the Richmond Times-Dispatch. Kevin, you didn't grow up far from Greensboro, just up Route 29. What would tomorrow be like in the Greensboro Coliseum if Duke and State were playing in the Elite Eight? If it was in Greensboro? Yeah. Oh, man, you must be – you're trying to take a dig at Bayheim, huh? That's what you <laughs> – <laughs> No, it, it, listen, Dallas is a great place, and I'm not going to, you know, obviously, we're going to, I think we're going to have just as many fans here as we would have Greensboro. And you know my heart, you know, Greensboro is Greensboro. I grew up, you know, in Lynchburg, Virginia, watching the tournament in Greensboro, and it was such a special, unique place. Um, it's funny, I was thinking about it last night, like, man, we both could have just flown home and played this game somewhere. Probably at the PNC would be a good idea. Um, but it's it's um, it, it's going to be a great you know opportunity whether we play it in Greensboro. Would it have been great at Greensboro? Absolutely. Um, but they're not hosting a region this time, so we got to play it here. And the folks at Dallas have been great. Um, you know, NC State. I hope we've treated the, uh, treated the. Um, the Dallas folks great, and I hope they all come out and wear red because we will welcome them to do that tomorrow. Dan Walken, USA Today. Uh, Kevin, how would you describe the challenge of differentiating your program, you know, at a time and in a location where so much of the attention goes to Duke and UNC, and yet, you know, you guys have a, you know, tremendous history, tremendous fan base, and tremendous expectations? I think like any place, you have to carve out your own space. You know, um, I'm into Shark Tank, so I watch that all the time. And we talk about having shelf space and how do you get, you know, your product on a shelf and everything else. You know, well, the one thing I've always, you know, when I took this job, I've never wanted to be compared to Duke or uh, Carolina. Just not who I am. And we do things a little bit different. And, you know, we want to. You know, obviously, I, I try to be and get our guys to be the best version of themselves, to our program to be the best version of those uh, ourselves. Um, but we've done a good job. I mean, you think about, you know, just over the you know, last couple of years in general, you know, we're one of three teams that have made the NCAA tournament, Duke, us, and Virginia in the, in the last two years by themselves. And, you know, now we're on this, you know, nice run um, because we've carved space out and we're doing things our way. and. Um, not trying to be someone else. Uh, we're, you know, it, you know. I, I thought about this. We have two milestones that has not happened in, in, at NC State in a long time. You know, the um, ACC championship since um, '87, the you know Elite Eight since '86. I think I'm right when I say that. Um, you know, we've done a good job. We're champions, and you know that's something that you want to strive to be. And we still have an opportunity to, to win another championship in another tournament. So doesn't um, this is great for our fan base because I know obviously they get involved with it as much as anybody, but I love where we at and love what we're doing as a program. Again on the extreme right. Kevin Luke Cock from the News and Observer. John said earlier that he reached out to you after you guys won and that you actually called him back and you guys had a conversation. Wow. You get a lot of congratulatory texts and messages. Why did you call John back, and what did you guys talk about? Well, I, last night when I got to my phone, I probably had 500 text messages. 
And um, I responded to each one. Um, that's just who I am. But I have a lot of respect for the coaches in our league. And, you know, and not, I shouldn't even say just our league, just around the country. If somebody's going to take time to reach out to me, then that's the least, least thing I can do is reach out and talk and have a conversation. And I thought it was great. And, and through this run, um, I've had, Luke, I've had plenty of our coaches in our league and coach, coaches across the country reach out. We're small fraternity. I know there's a lot of competition and on game day, we're going to, everybody's going to go at each other. But throughout that, you know, I think it's important that we do talk about our conference. We do talk about different things that we go through. And I thought it was, you know, great for John to reach out. Coach, let's move all the way to the extreme left now, and then we will go to Zoom. Stephen Hawkins with the AP. I'm going to ask you what I ask the players. What do you sense really different from your team's meeting against Duke the regular season to the tournament to now? Yeah, you know, we, we, be, we have become really a very stingy basketball team on the defensive end. Our defense and numbers are so great. Um, you know, you think about last night just in general, four for 31 against a very good Marquette team who can shoot the ball behind the three-point line. Um, you know, we, our deflections are up. I try to chart, you know, we try to get 40 deflections a game. I try to chart them every game, and our deflections are up. Uh, we're, our ball screen coverage has become better. You know, I thought initially we established ourselves against Marquette in the first 10 minutes on the defensive end, and then we got going offensively. I think it's just our defense have improved, and our guys are connected more on the defensive end than we've been, you know, during the regular season. Let's go to Zoom. Okay, we have another question from Roger. Roger, please unmute yourself and then restate your name and affiliation and proceed with your question. Hey, Roger Rubin from Newsday in New York. Uh, Coach, it's a question about Michael O'Connell and uh, the qualities that he brings to the team. Since, uh, since you guys have gotten onto this winning streak, I believe he's played at least 30 minutes in every game. Can you describe what it is about his game that you think is so important to have on the court to win? Well, he's playing with so much confidence. Like Michael in the regular season would go through a game and didn't care if he took two shots. And, and now, you know, going into this postseason, we've asked him to do a little bit more. He's a great descript, distributor, but we've asked him to score the basketball. And he's done that. I mean, you look at his numbers, you know, I think the two most, three most important guys in the postseason that have added something to our team is Michael, Mo, and then Ben. You know, all of those guys have added something that, they, that we didn't have regular season. I also think he's found his voice. You know, it takes a little bit of time for transfers to come in and find their voice, even though he's an older guy. And now he's coaching on the floor. Everything that I envision of him being a point guard is what's happening. He scores when we need a basket. He passes his most of the time to get everybody involved. And his leadership in the locker room and doing timeouts have been really huge for us. And I think that's the biggest steps. Okay, front of the TV camera now. Coach, I was struck watching warm-ups yesterday, just looking at the body language of your team versus Marquette. You guys looked so loose and excited. And, you know, obviously there's a sense maybe of playing with house money and that, you know, this is a – every game is sort of a bonus. But at the same time, you know, as you get farther along in the tournament, the expectations do ramp up. So, you know, how have you been addressing that, you know, aspect of this tournament run? Yeah, it's weird. We are loose. I mean, we, we listen to a lot of music. I mean, we, you know, we were, we were going, um, you know, to, to go through a walk through this morning and I've learned so many. And I, I grew up in an era where there were great, you know, you know, rappers and we, we had great rap songs. And I, I know I'm, I got a bunch of them, but I've learned so many different songs, different rap songs I've never seen. Here's the other thing about it. We just don't listen to rap too. On game day, coming back from shoot around, we, we, we put on gospel music and we're blasting that is just as much as we are the rap songs, and they they know every word to each one of them. So we're loose. Uh, the the house money thing, we don't we don't look at it as house money. We didn't come here to say, hey, you've won enough, and just go out there and play, and you have nothing to lose. We do think we have something to lose. We came to win, and so we don't count on that, you know. And and that's I understand. Obviously, that's where it looks when you you come in as 11 seed and you're in the elite eight. But honestly, these guys are here to win, you know. OK, 
Okay, in the back now, on the right. Uh, Kevin, Adam Teicher from ESPN. You said a couple minutes ago you thought Duke was a, a much different team than when you played him a few weeks ago. Why? What, what do you see different in them now that you didn't maybe see a couple weeks ago? I think the veterans. Um, Flip, you know, I'm calling him a veteran because obviously he's a you know, second-year guy, but he's playing much more aggressive. Um, I think more early in the year he was more outside in. Now he's more inside out, and he's scoring in so many different ways and playing great. I, you look at the way Jeremy Roach is playing. You know, he's playing like a guy who's been in the league, who's been around for a long time, a guy who is, you know, obviously playing in the NCAA tournament at a high level. Um, you know, they, they the older guys are helping the young guys. I mean, they just are. They're doing a great job, and um, I think that's the big, biggest difference in those guys. And, and the other one as a team, they're better defensively um, than I've seen even two weeks ago. Now toward the front. Kevin, obviously it works both ways, but strictly from your standpoint, how much of an advantage with the quick turnaround is it to prepare for a team that you've already played twice in the last month as opposed to somebody you're seeing for the first time? Yeah, that's, I, I guess you're, you're right. It works both ways. Um, it, it probably helps both teams because we got a, such a short turnaround and, you know, just we're familiar. And, you know, John's like me. Can we put in 20 different plays today? No. Um, so we, you know, everybody at this point, you're going to be who you are. I think it helps that we know each other. But you think about what we had to go through in the ACC tournament. We didn't even have the one day in between to prepare, and so we just—it's almost weird because when we when we got to the NCAA tournament and we won our our first game, I'm thinking we're going to play the next day because we're so used to playing. And then you realize you got a day in between, so I, it helps. Um, but at this, I told you guys before at the beginning of this, at you know when it comes to March, players make plays. I mean, we we gonna as as a, as coaches, we pull a lot of strings and we substitute guys and we try to put them in great spots. But you see so many storylines with guys who are just making plays. Okay, now here on the uh, inside aisle on coaches left. Yeah, Rob McLean with Inside Pack Sports. If you don't mind, sir, I have two questions. My first, I asked them about your background. D3 player, the prep, Louisville, the national championship. So much of this prepares you in life for this moment. How much of it are you drawing from that? And just how, how meaningful has your past experience to helping you get where you are now? Well, I want to be an inspiration. I mean, I don't I, – you never want to hide from where you came from. And, you know, I, I spent, you know, um, a lot of time at prep school at Hargrave Military Academy and started off as assistant for a couple of years, got the head job, left, went to college, and then came back for eight years. So I had a total of 12 years. But during that time, you know, I didn't have, it wasn't a national media thing. I could call timeouts, I could draw up plays, I could, you know, practice, um, you know, make practice plans. And if I made a mistake, nobody cared. Just wasn't, you know. But I could lean on that because it helped me get better. And then obviously, you know, my experience of going on to be assistant coach, you know, I was fortunate enough to be a part of the, you know, 2013 national championship team in Louisville when we climbed on the top of the nets and cut the nets down. I worked for a, guy, a great coach in Rick Patino that, you know, challenged you every day. And we would do scouting reports and I couldn't have any paper in my hand and I had to remember 30 plays and present it to the team. That's also helped me because now I can remember if, if I'm in a, in a huddle, I can remember a play that back in the Big East when Pittsburgh run, ran a play, you know, five years ago, and I want to present that play to my team. I can do that stuff. So my experience is at, you know, the high school grassroots level, um, being an assistant coach, and then going to UNCW when I had my first job as a mid-major has paid off so much. Uh, I hope that I'm inspiring a lot of people because you don't have to be just a, you know, a power five player uh, to be you know, a power five head coach. There's other ways to get there. And you look across the country, some of the, the best coaches in the world have come from the same path that I've, I've traveled and I love it. I, I think it's great. I, if I can share with any, you know, inspiring um, young lady, young man, 
you know, to, to work hard and get where you are. I'm the, um, you're sitting here looking at hard work. I drove the bus at Hargrave. I, you know, I pumped the gas. I swept the floor. I washed the clothes. And, uh, man, I did this. The good Lord put me in this spot, so I'm glad to be here. Sorry, so much of NC State is based on history and heritage, and that's like an, an end-all, be-all at Wolfpack. Obviously, you're aligning yourself with the great teams in the past, but are you sort of trying to find that balance where, hey, let's create our own history, let's create our own mark in this university? No, I think history is great, and, you know, we do have great history. Uh, but what I'm learning is we've got great history, but it's been so long ago. I mean, you think about this when we won the championship and we're reminded that it's been 37 years. And then obviously we go to the Elite Eight, it's been, we were reminded of how long it's been. I hope that history gets a chance to repeat itself because um, this team deserves it. Um, I love this group and if, you know, we, they've already uh, etched their uh, way into the history books by winning an ACC championship. We're going to hang a banner and those, those guys in that locker room are going to be the um, you know, the reason why that banner's been hung hadn't happened in 37 years. We're the Elite Eight. They're going to be remembered for that. But as we move on, I do hope history repeats itself because we got great history. It's just been a long time. Yeah. We'll continue on coaches left and then move to the right. Hey, Griffin Cunningham, technician in Agromech. Um, before the ACC title run, there was a lot of speculation about what would happen with the team next year, whether you would be the head coach. Um, how do you how did you dispel and confront those those speculations and how do you feel about coach turnover at all levels in sports? Yeah, I think I think if you I think if you watched us over the you know last seven years, I don't think that you would feel that way. And here's why I say this: is you, when I took over this program, um, they were coming off of four wins and five wins in the conference. And by the way, when I did my first opening, um, right before practice, I did my first um, press conference. Uh, it was mentioned that you know the FBI is investigating us. So I went through four years of not getting a recruit, losing recruits, not knowing what the NCAA was going to do to us, and and we did it. And and our staff and we walked through you know the program through it as champions and never complained. Um, we started off our first year after taking over the program. We went straight to the NCAA tournament. Should have went back the next year when we were 33 in the net and got left out. Then we had a year when they didn't have the tournament. So we've had some of those bad lucks, and, and, and it's now it's paying off at the end because at the end of the day, we have built the program. But year one, two, and three were not year one, two, and three at normal years, years because of the scrutiny that we had uh, anybody who has, you know, had a new program while they were going through that NCAA investigation, if you remember, uh, the FBI agent came out and said, we got your playbook. Anybody that was a new coach, they had to go through that. If you were a sitting coach doing that, you were able to keep your culture and everything else. But we played musical chairs a lot because of that part of it. So I know it's a long answer, but, you know, I, I never worry about that. Um, I poured – everything I have into my program, into my kids. And um, to be honest with you, I just relied on my faith and I left everything in the good Lord's hand and whatever was gonna happen was gonna happen, but I was gonna make sure that I did everything that I could and did everything right by those young men. We have about five minutes left in this session. We'll try to squeeze in these three questions on the right. Now on the front. Coach, uh, is there anyone in the athletic department close to the program at the school or, or at the school that that was there in 83 that's still at North Carolina State that, that you've met? Or? Oh, yeah. You know, Derek Wittenberg, is, he's on staff in the athletic department. And um, he's – Yeah, Derek, Derek's former – other than them? Uh, God, that's a tough one. You know, maybe Bobby Purcell who just – you know, he's head of the Woodpack Club. He just retired a couple of years ago. Um, we got a great, you know, we got a, you know, some great, you know, uh, guys who work around our buildings and do all of the dirty work and the great stuff to make sure that everything is fine for us who may have been there. I don't, I don't know if there's anybody else, but I, I bring up Derek Wittenberg because, you know, on that uh, air ball that he shot, 
he's been getting NIL since he shot that air ball. He, he says in the past. And so what we did not know is that NIL started a long time ago. The guy hasn't paid for a meal since he, he shot that. So he's been – now, don't report that because some of that may have been a violation if he was still playing back in the day. But I think we're past the, uh, the time. So, But I, I, don't, I don't know that. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the aisle. Hey, Kevin Gene Wong with the Washington Post. What have been some of Casey's most valuable contributions during this run, and, and how gratifying was it to see him be able to go back home and win the ACC championship? Yeah, I'm so happy for Casey. I mean, you know, when he transferred here, what a tough transition. He went from a great program with Tony Bennett, who, which is a low-scoring, hard-hat, great defensive team, to a team who runs, who does it a different way, you know, who's got more freedom a little bit. Um, not saying either one is better than the other, but he adjusted. Um, he stuck with us a little bit. He's done a great job. You know, he's brought some defense intensity. He's brought some senior leadership to us. Um, I'm happy. I joked with him at, at D.C. I was like, man, you're the last guy standing from the DMV. At that point, it was him and Armando Baycock. I was like, whoever wins that game is going to win the DMV. Um, and you, you can explain to some of these guys later on what DMV means. Most of them won't know that part of it, but. Okay, closing questions now for Coach Extreme Right. Kevin, how much has it added to this experience of the last two weeks to have your son in the locker room? Yeah, it's it's a God, it's a it's a wonderful deal, and I never would have thought that. You know, I never coming up, I, I was that dad that would go to the high school games, and I would sit by myself because fans are crazy at high school games, parents are crazy, and they would talk trash, and then everybody would look at me when the referee would make a bad call because I was a coach, and I wouldn't respond. I wouldn't. I just would look straight ahead. And I never really tried to coach him at the games because I knew all, all eyes would be on me to figure out, you know, hey, could I could validate whether it's a bad call or not. And I did most of my coaching when he got home. We would sit down and talk. Um, but I love both of my kids, and it was it's great. You know, we, we talked about, you know, what was he going to do for college? And, you know, uh, he said, I wanted to kind of go to NC State and stay with you. And um, secretly, that was a great deal because I was so pumped about that. I loved it. And it's great to have him around. You know, he does, um, you know, I just, it's just great. It's, a, it's, a, it's hard to describe uh, unless you have a son who has played for you or a daughter who have played for you, but um, he brings a lot of value. He's, he's smart. I don't know what path he's going to take. Uh, I'm going to do my best to convince him not to get into coaching. Uh, I'm going to tell him about that stuff. But it's special. It's really special. And uh, I get to, you know, the problem with it is I get more time to see him uh, than his mother. And he lives in the same, we, you know, he, we right there in the same area. And he doesn't come home, and she complains to me. And I said, uh, and who, by the way, he loves to death. But, you know, once those kids go to college, I don't care if they're 10 minutes away or they're five hours away, they're going to stay away unless they have to come home for their dirty clothes or something like that. But it's special. It's, it's, it means everything to me.